All right. Uh, well, welcome, everyone. It is uh, 7.01, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Alex Durr, and I want to welcome you all to How to Climb Your First 14er, uh, my sort of regular session I offer every several months um, that gives you everything you need to know to make it to the top of a summit safely and successfully. Um, during the uh, the session here, if you ever want to ask a question um, uh, about what we're talking about, uh, just enter that right into the Q&A uh, window, and uh, I will check that periodically and try to stop and answer those uh, uh, as it comes up. We'll also have some time at the end that I always try to save for some additional Q&A. So if there's uh, something you have a question about, um, you can go ahead and ask it then if it doesn't really make sense to um, during the session itself. With that, though, um, I want to start uh, with a poll just to kind of get an idea of where um, all of you are at in terms of your ability level so that I can sort of, uh, you know, try to match where you're all at uh, in today's session. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and launch uh, two really quick polls, or one question each. Um, and so the first uh, is sort of broadly asking, what is your experience level in the mountains? And by this, I mean hiking, camping. Uh, really just spending time out in the outdoors up in elevation. Um, so um, that can be in any activity, but it's just sort of to get get an idea of if, if you're coming in out of state and you know you've never been to a mountain or if this is something you you do and you just really haven't done a 14 year yet. So go ahead and, and answer that. Um, and we'll leave that open for a, a few seconds and then look at the results here. We'll give it another five seconds here to get any last votes in. All righty. So it looks like the general consensus here is most people have a, a little bit of experience followed by a moderate bit. Um, thankfully, it looks like nobody here is a, a total beginner to the mountains. You all have at least some experience. And so so that's good. I'll try to, uh, to keep that in mind as we're moving here through the session. Um, I have one other poll here, uh, one more question, um, and this one's more specific to the topic here. Um, it's it's just asking, what is your experience uh, with 14ers? So we've got, you know, uh, you've never tried to climb one and you don't really want to. You're just here for for kicks, I guess. Um, there's you've never tried to climb one, but you want to. Um, there's you've tried to climb one, but you had to turn back. And then, of course, there's those of you who've climbed one at least or you've climbed more than one. So. Go ahead and answer that question here. It looks like a good number of you already are. We'll leave this open for a few more seconds here. All righty. I'm going to go ahead and publish these results here. So it looks like more than half of the group has never uh, never tried to climb a 14er, um, but they do want to. Um, so that's great. That's You're in the exact right place to be. Um, another uh, significant group, uh, about a quarter of the group, has climbed at least or speci specifically one 14er. So that's great. Um, you have a little experience. Um, this is a good place to kind of lock in what you've learned. Um, and then we have a few sort of experienced people who've done it, done more than one 14er. So welcome to you all. And hopefully this is a good refresher for you all on, on, on what to do when you're up there. With that, um, we're going to dive right into the session itself here. Um, uh, uh, like I said, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, post it in the Q&A. Uh, Courtney just posted that she's climbing Beersted Thursday. That's awesome. Um, very cool. Hopefully, this will help you uh, help you get ready for that. So um, with that, uh, we're going to dive in. Um, first of all, uh, who am I? <laughs> uh, my name is Alex Durr. Uh, I'm the uh, creator of the Next Summit uh, and uh, a Colorado hiker and mountaineer. I've got about 45 plus ascents above 13,000 feet, and I'm an Eagle Scout and, and really just been a hiker my whole life. Um, I am Wilderness First Aid certified, and, and I am a lead no trace trainer, so I understand a lot about the safety and sustainability side of 14ers. Uh, and I actually came out to Colorado to get my uh, master's degree in environmental policy. So I, I come to this work with a, from a couple different perspectives and angles. Uh, but really, I think my my biggest uh, relevant point to all of this is just that I'm obsessed with with helping people get outside and and really experience 14ers. It's something that I sort of stumbled into when I moved out here and, and fell in love with. And uh, I'm excited to share that with others and keep them safe doing it. 
Um, I started the next summit um, after a fateful trip up on Long's Peak, which is is visited here or, or shown here. Um, I was climbing up uh, and uh, barely made it up to the summit around noon. And on my way down, I uh, sort of started to get chased by a thunderstorm. And I was pretty shocked to watch, you know, a Congo line of people totally ignoring the fact that you couldn't you couldn't see the peak here. It was so buried in in storm clouds. Uh, people were just hiking up into the clouds. You know, um, I would stop them and say, hey, you know, there's a thunderstorm up there. Um, you might want to think about turning around. Uh, and th they would say things like, you know, don't worry, I've got a hat on. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm ready. Um, obviously, it's, it's not the rain that kills you. So um, that was the moment I decided, you know, we, we really need to do more when it comes to um, educating people about how to stay safe on the 14ers, um, because there are some challenges and there are some things that really do make it more than just a hike. You know, it really is climbing a mountain. So um, I started writing, uh, started creating resources. Um, I maintain a blog, I do webinars, all to help, um, you know, get people out there and stay safe. So this is one aspect of that, but hopefully um, you'll take some time to check out the other resources I have online. A little bit of background here on the 14ers, um, since most of you are new to them. Um, there are 53 in Colorado, uh, and they range from 14,001 feet up to 14,439 feet. Um, I should pause to note that this session is, is mostly focused on the Colorado 14ers. Um, however, everything I say really does apply for the most part to the California 14ers. So if you're here asking or looking about those specifically, um, pretty much everything will still apply, just a, a heads up. Um, the official list of Colorado 14ers now is uh, is about 53. Um, these are peaks that rise at least 300 feet above any saddles that they share with a taller peak. Um, otherwise, we just consider them a sub peak. So um, if you consider, though, any peak with a official name as part of the list, um, that brings it up to 58. So these are the two most common 14er uh, lists you'll see online, either 53 or 58 if you include the named ones. Um, most of the 14ers are hikes, uh, but about 15 to 20 of them are dangerous class three, class four uh, scrambles or climbs. In California, this is the opposite case. Uh, only a, a handful of them are hike hikeable, and, and the vast majority of them are, are much more difficult climbs. The, uh, the first step to plan your first 14er trip is going to be planning a peak and a route. Uh, you can set yourself up for success from the very start by picking a peak that's that's manageable and is, is right for your ability level. So in terms of factors to consider, uh, my advice is to start with a class one or a class two 14er. Uh, these are, are essentially hikes or scrambles, which means you're gonna use your hands, but really just for balance as you scramble over rocks horizontally. Another thing to consider is the trailheads because they aren't all accessible to every type of vehicle. A lot of them are gonna require four wheel drive, uh, Mount Beer stat, you should be good <laughs> with just two-wheel drive. Um, so that's for a, an example of a, a good accessible one. Uh, so definitely check that online to confirm you can actually get there with the car that you have. I also think you should probably take a standard route. A lot of mountains have more than one climbing route to get to the top. Uh, and the easiest one and the most popular one is usually called the standard route. Um, these are usually better for those who are new, uh, mostly because there's going to be more people on the route that you can, you know, talk to if something goes wrong, uh, it's easier to follow and it's just easier to climb. So definitely better for the, for those who are new. Uh, and then lastly, personal recommendation, I would avoid the front range, just me, um, if you can, simply because these are the busiest peaks in the state. They're also the closest peaks to Denver. So, you know, that's sort of the, uh, the obvious pro on them. But if you have the time and you have the ability to get a little bit further out, I highly recommend it because you have a lot less people on your trek uh, and in in my opinion, uh, just a better overall experience. In terms of a couple specific recommendations, because people always ask me, okay, but which you know which one is the best? Um, I picked a couple. These are by no means the best overall, but they're good options for beginners. Uh, definitely solid options. And I tried to pick peaks that have less less crowds uh, than some of the other ones. So my overall favorite on the left here is going to be Handy's Peak. It's down in the the San Juan mountain range, and it's it's pretty far away from Denver, about five and a half hours, uh, and it requires four-wheel drive. This, however, means you have a lot of solitude in the area. You're going to probably be one of very few people on the mountain on any given day. So if you're looking for lots of peace and quiet on your trip, this is the one to go to.
you might not have enough time to drive six hours all the way down to Handy's. I don't blame you. Uh, so if you want a good compromise option, I would go with Huron Peak in the Sawatch Range near uh, Buena Vista. Uh, this is a beautiful mountain uh, with really gorgeous views all the way along the hike uh, as you climb. And it's only about three hours from Denver. It does still require four wheel drive. So if you uh, if don't want to go out and buy a Jeep, uh, the third option on the list is going to be on the right here, uh, Mount Sherman. This is only two hours from Denver. It's it's near Fair Play uh, in, in South Park. Uh, and it only requires a two-wheel drive to get up to the upper trailhead. So Mount Sherman's a good option if you really don't want massive crowds. Um, if you don't want massive crowds, but you you still don't uh, want to drive, you know, three, four hours. And you don't want four-wheel drive. Um, someone just asked, is a four-wheel drive good for Handys uh, and Huron? Um, or all-wheel drive. Yes, in my experience, all-wheel drive works just fine. Um, I've, I've driven out there in a, in a couple different all-wheel drive vehicles. So uh, the key, in my experience, is really more about clearance, uh, how much space you have off the ground. Um, and most all-wheel drive and four-wheel drive vehicles will have enough clearance. So um, definitely just recommend taking your time um, You know, when, when you're on those roads, because they can definitely be tough. But all-wheel drive usually works if it says four-wheel drive. That's a great question. So those are my three recommendations for a first 14er um, if, you're, if you're still looking for one. Um, someone just said uh, are, are they're doing Quandary on Thursday. Uh, any thoughts? Um, only uh, My only big one on Quandary is just to make sure you know about the parking, uh, parking situation there. Um, they have a permit requirement system or a parking uh, ticket system, I should say, that you have to uh, pre-register for a parking spot or take the uh, the shuttle from town. So yeah, that's that's the only thing I would mention on Quandary specifically. It's a great mountain. I love it. <laughs> uh, that was my first one I did in winter. So definitely a great peak. In terms of the climbing season, we're like right in the middle of it um, right now, mid-June through mid-September. Um, I say mid-September with a grain of salt because um, you know, there's a, a lot of times when you... Uh, Oh, I'm sorry, I'm having a technical difficulty. Oh, there we go. Um, there's a lot of times in, uh, depending on the time of year, where you can have some real, uh, there we go, I'm back. <laughs> um, a lot of times in September, you can get snowstorms uh, pretty early. So it depends really when you get your first snowfall of the year. That's the end of the, uh, the season. Uh, it's a good idea to check the recent weather because we can get snow um, or freezing weather any time of year. And it's good to know about when you're heading out there so you know what to find. It's also a good idea to go on a weekday. So for those of you who said you're going on Thursdays, good good decision making. Um, the crowds are significantly smaller on weekdays compared to a Saturday or Sunday. Um, they kind of look like a circus on, on, on true weekends. Um, going early is also a really good idea both to avoid crowds and to avoid thunderstorms, which we will talk about in a minute. So once you've picked a peak and you're sure you can make it to the trailhead, um, you can start really uh, preparing and researching for your trip in detail. The first part of this is, is looking at the route itself. Um, I recommend finding a route description and a map and reading through the entire description and, and tracing it along the map to, to make sure you know about any junctions uh, and just things to watch for. Like I said, always ensure that you can make the patrol head. I include it multiple times uh, because it does pop up uh, a lot for people. Uh, and I recommend doing two big points of research online, uh, specifically on 14ers.com, which is uh, one of the best resources out there for 14ers. Uh, these are peak condition reports and trip reports. Uh, and I've got an example of each of them here. So. Uh, the trip report here on the left is a full narrative style report. Um, you can see the, the picture of it here. It's got a lot of long paragraphs of text describing what happened on their trip, how they got ready, you know, how they got there, what they saw, what happened, uh, as well as pictures. And it's, it's good for you know, understanding a route and, and sort of getting the feel for it. On the right, we have a peak condition uh, report or more accurately, about six of them. These are much shorter and sweeter, only about a few sentences long, and they really just share how the trail conditions are, how busy it is, and anything else you need to know that's very important to plan. So between the two of them, you should be able to get both sort of a high level idea of what it'll be like, as well as some detailed information about what to expect. So they're really, really good for, for uh, getting ready for a 14er. 
checking for the weather forecast is extremely important because uh, as you probably can expect, the weather's crazy up at alt alt um, altitude. Colorado also creates its own weather pattern in the summer called the Colorado monsoon, uh, where we get a lot of hot, moist air that comes in from, uh, from the uh, Southern oceans, uh, comes into Colorado. And when it hits the mountains, it's forced upward. Uh, specifically as the mountains heat up throughout the day, uh, they start to radiate heat upward and that starts a convection cycle, which essentially creates a thunderstorm. So it's true that to a degree, the mountains are generating their own weather uh, and generating thunderstorms all throughout the summer, uh, usually in the early afternoon. So uh, this is why it's really important to check the weather, uh, have an idea of, of if you're coming into a good weekend or a good day, or if you should expect a lot of storms. It's a general idea, good idea to just be prepared for anything. Uh, forecasts are totally wrong. I, I usually say about 33% of the time, one in three times. They're also totally correct about one in three times. And then they're completely somewhere in the middle, uh, the last third. So uh, even if it says there's no rain expected, I would always bring that rain jacket. You know, even if it says it's going to be sunny and warm, I would still bring those extra warm layers because there's a one in three chance you're probably gonna need them. The best two resources for weather forecast research, uh, first is, is mountainforecast.com. They use uh, like their own model simulations to, to create weather forecasts for peaks. Uh, and then the second is the NOAA website. They have a pretty cool map click feature that lets you just select a, uh, a location on a map and get a, a weather uh, forecast detailed, very detailed specifically for that point. So between the two of them, you should get a pretty good idea of what to expect uh, for the upcoming weather. Uh, it's not a, a bad idea to do this multiple times. I usually will check the weather, you know, one week out before my climb, uh, two or three days out, and then essentially every day from then on until I'm literally leaving my car, you know, at the trailhead, I'll try to check it one last time. Uh, because of course, the weather forecast does get much more accurate the closer you get. So your your final forecast uh, as you head out into the, the backcountry is gonna be your most accurate one. So, so always check it. All right, so step three, we're on to packing for your trip and figuring out what's necessary, what's what's a good idea to bring and what is, what is not necessary and is it just gonna weigh you down. I always start with the 10 essentials. Uh, this is a list of life-saving gear put together by a group called the Mountaineers out in uh, the, the West Coast, uh, I think Seattle. Uh, and they put together the list specifically to help people respond actively to emergencies in the mountains. So they found uh, in a lot of their studies and research that people who didn't make it in accidents were people who were passively dependent on search and rescue. It was the people who had enough basic supplies to sort of fend for themselves in the very short term. They were the ones who were much more likely to make it if someone gets injured or lost or sick. So with that speaking, I, I recommend always bringing these 10, 10 items or, or groups of items, and we'll just run through these quick. Um, the first is navigation equipment like GPS, uh, although a map and a compass is always a good idea because it can't break and it can't run out of batteries. A headlamp and extra batteries is, is definitely necessary. Even if you think it's just gonna be a day trip, it often goes way later than you expect. Sun protections, it's huge because the sun is a lot stronger up at higher altitudes. So it's pretty easy to get sunburned even in the winter, sunglasses and sunscreen. And then a first aid kit and insect repellent. Um, first aid kit's the big part. And I recommend not skimping because if you really do actually, you know, really mess up your leg, uh, you don't want to be trying to use band-aids to fix it. You know, make sure there's gauze and make sure there's others some some more serious things in there uh, besides just a few band-aids. A knife or a multi-tool is a good idea. I recommend a multi-tool because it's just got a lot more flexibility and features. Fire starting equipment uh, so you can stay warm if you get stuck out overnight. The more robust, the better. Uh, some kind of a strong lighter or, you know, with some fire lighting materials is, is a great idea. Uh, and then shelter. Um, and this one can range quite a bit. You know, if you're just going out on a day trip, some kind of thin emergency blanket is probably going to be okay. Uh, but if you're going out for anything overnight or longer, you probably want an emergency bivy of some kind. Uh, this is a sort of like a tent that it's only small enough uh, for just you literally to fit in, or just slightly larger than a sleeping bag. So they're not necessarily super comfortable, but they keep you safe and they keep you warm uh, to help you survive an unplanned night or two outdoors. 
Lastly, you definitely want to bring extra food, you know, high protein, high calorie food, extra water and the means to get more, uh, something like a, a water filter or some tablets. And then lastly, just extra clothing and layers so that if you're stuck out overnight, you've got something extra to put on as the temperature drops because it drops quite a bit at night up at altitude. In terms of clothing, speaking of staying warm, uh, layers are your best friend in the mountains because they let you adapt to the changing temperature. As you go up the mountain, things are gonna get colder, uh, about three degrees for every you know thousand feet. So you know if you go up four thousand feet, it's gonna drop at least ten degrees, uh, and put in usually more, usually more about fifteen to twenty. So um, the wind is also a lot stronger, usually higher up, and that's something to be mindful of as well. I recommend uh, sort of a three layer system as your your base. Um, so starting with a base layer, uh, something like uh, merino wool or under armor that will help wick away your sweat so that you don't get bogged down in it and it evaporates away. The second layer is some kind of a warm fleece um, uh, or, or a thicker shirt, not cotton, but a flannel will work. Um, just something to keep you warm. And then finally, I, I bring a puffy jacket of some kind, um, like uh, you've probably seen those popular um, Patagonia puffy jackets, um, something like that you can use likely above tree line when, when things really get cold. The other three staples to always keep with you are a pair of good gloves to keep your hands warm and a good warm hat to keep your hat or your ears warm because these two areas are some of the most easily chilled if you get caught in some really cold winds. Um, even in Jul July, I've seen people um, you know, re almost freeze their fingers off because the wind's so cold up there. So gloves and a hat are a great idea. And also rain gear. Like I said, you never know when it's gonna rain. So definitely a good idea. The last sort of key pieces of gear here are, are first of all, hiking boots for your feet. You can use hiking shoes, but hiking boots are, I think, the, the gold standard because they provide more ankle support and traction. So you're gonna have a better hold of the rocks uh, on the trail. And if you, you know, trip, you're gonna be less likely to roll your ankle and uh, and twist things. Uh, I usually bring about a 15 to 30 liter backpack. I think mine is specifically a 22 liter backpack. So that's more than enough to carry the 10 essentials uh, along with some, some of these extra gear items. Trekking poles are definitely optional, uh, but I use them every time. These are essentially ski poles that collapse or, or fold together so you can store them away. Uh, and they really help you channel your upper body strength into your movement as you're moving uphill, uh, which is a, a huge boon. Uh, and they also help on the downhill descent, uh, sort of soften the blow on your knees. Um, I tore my ACL a couple years back, and so that's a, a very helpful feature for me uh, just to, to cushion that a little bit. They're also great for steam crossings and a whole host of other you know, uh, situations. So. Trucking poles, I, I swear by them. And lastly, for, for gear, um, I recommend a spot device or a satellite messenger, especially if you're going to be doing more than one 14er. Um, you know, if this is the one one peak you're ever going to climb and that's it, you know, you probably, it's not worth the investment. But if you plan to do five or 10 um, or all of them, or even if you plan to spend a lot of time backpacking or camping in the mountains, um, these devices are, are pretty important. Uh, mostly because they allow you to get help uh, in an area where a cell phone wouldn't work, uh, which is a lot of areas in the backcountry. So um, more and more search and rescue is saying that a spot device has been the difference between life or death for people. Um, you know, when they got injured or hurt or sick, they were able to get help uh, when they needed it, uh, when they normally wouldn't have with just a cell phone. So I highly recommend them. They're They're usually worth the investment. Step four is dealing with the altitude. Um, altitude's a pretty unique aspect of the 14ers. I would say it's their defining feature, you know, is their elevation, and that comes with problems. A study out on Mount Whitney in California, which is a 14er, uh, found that 43% of those who reached the summit uh, had some level of acute mountain sickness, which is the technical term for altitude sickness. Um, it was a pretty cool study. They literally hauled up their medical gear all the way up to the summit and, and took oxygenation uh, readings and pulse and, and other stats for everyone who reached the summit, uh, as well as a survey to help figure out why some people got it and some didn't. Um, 
little bit of, of definitions here though, you know, like I said, AMS is acute mountain sickness and it is literally just an oxygen shortage in your system due to low air pressure and oxygen content. So um, there's not enough air in the, the, or oxygen in the air to breathe and it causes havoc on your body in a host of different ways. And there's really only, way, only one way to treat it, which is by descending. Some people say you can treat AMS by taking ibuprofen uh, and that's not really true. You can treat the symptoms of it you might be able to treat the headache, but you cannot treat AMS unless you descend to a lower uh, elevation. So that's important to remember. And it's important to remember mostly because AMS can progress and it can become life-threatening if you don't address it when it's becoming moderate level. Um, HACE and HAPE, uh, these are two life-threatening forms of AMS. Uh, they are very rare in uh, Colorado, California, um, anywhere at 14,000 feet. However, they do happen, and usually when you read the story, it's because someone ignored, you know, very clear signs that, that they had AMS and continued to climb and ascend anyways, rather than, than going low, uh, you know, to get to, to improve. Um, so definitely symptoms to watch for are, uh, you know, headache, nausea, fatigue, confusion, disorientation, um, which really do match a lot of the symptoms of dehydration. So one other tip is, you know, if you do feel dehydrated or, uh, you know, if you feel um, nauseous, you have a headache, take a break on your hike and sip some water, you know, maybe sip water for a good 15 or 20 minutes. And if you feel considerably better, there's a good chance you actually were suffering from dehydration and not AMS. So that's just one, one little tip. The study, like I said, used a, a survey to try to figure out what the, the factors were affecting people's AMS. And the four biggest factors they found first were age. Uh, younger people were more susceptible generally to AMS than older people. The second was the use of Diamox. It's a medication that any uh, general family physician can prescribe. Uh, and it essentially helps you breathe at a slightly faster pace so that you get more oxygen you know, per minute uh, to help you. So. Um, that makes a big difference in reducing your risk of AMS. The third was the amount of time that people spent above 9,000 feet in the previous uh, 30 days. So this is what we call acclimation, essentially, uh, which is giving your body time to adjust to the altitude and, and change. Your body will actually produce more hemoglobin in your blood so that it can carry more oxygen. Uh, and it'll also change other functions to use less and be more efficient. So a lot happens all on its own just by spending time up, up at a higher elevation. And then fourth, uh, people who had a previous history of AMS in the study were more likely to experience it in the future. So there is some truth here that AMS affects different people differently. Uh, some people report it getting it very easily on all the time. I actually have a friend who gets it as low as eight or 9,000 feet. Uh, at a debilitating level to the point that he he can't do a 14er. He starts to uh, to vomit anytime he gets close to 10 or 11,000 feet. So there are other people who have climbed a dozen, two dozen 14ers and have never had even a headache. So it really ranges. Uh, and if you are someone who experiences very strong AMS, um, I highly recommend talking to your physician because you may be a good candidate for Diamox. Generally speaking though, uh, you don't need medication, um, you know, if you're sort of in the average in the population. Um, all you really need is to spend one or two nights at or above 9,000 feet uh, to help reduce your risk. I think right around 9,000 to 10,000 feet is sort of the sweet spot where you're you're high enough to be actually acclimating. Uh, you know, if you're down in Denver at 5,000 feet, realistically, um, it's better than nothing, but you're 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 missing out on a lot of the benefits of acclimation, which come above eight to nine thousand feet. So, um, e an easy way to do this is to just head to the trailhead one night before your climb uh, and find a dispersed camping site because most of the fourteen or trailheads have a lot of sites all around the the trailhead and and leading up to the trailhead along the road. So you can just pull in, camp for free get up early the next morning and head out to climb the peak. So it's it's helps you avoid an extra early morning drive and it gets that acclimation in. So it's kind of a win-win. Uh, Sarah just asked, do all the 14ers start above 9,000 feet? Uh, that's a good question. Most of them do. Um, the vast majority of them start uh, somewhere between nine and 10,000 feet. Um, 
some of the easier ones start above 11,000 feet or, or yeah, above 11,000. So it's, it's less than 3000 feet of climb. Uh, and then there are a few, um, pike, uh, I'm, I'm struggling to think of which ones right now, but there are a few that do have more than five, six, seven thousand feet of climb. So, uh, those are the tougher ones. Don't recommend them. <laughs> um, Somebody asked, does doing the Manitou incline count as doing Pikes Peak? Um, I believe that the Manitou incline, I've never actually done the Manitou incline. It's one of the few popular trails I've yet to be been to. Uh, I believe it it starts out and then connects with the bar trail later on. And the bar trail is the main trail that takes you to Pike Peak. So um, if you take the Manitou incline, you can continue along that route and, and eventually get up to Pikes Peak, um, if that makes sense. Already, um, yes, yeah, um, Susan just agreed that it cuts three miles off the trail, essentially because you're going straight up the entire time. So um, it's it's quite the uh, quite the challenge. All right, uh, last point here on the uh, altitude question is simply uh, uh, to avoid boost oxygen and other oxygen can projects. Um, they're honestly gimmicks uh, and there's just not good research that shows they work uh, to cure AMS or to, uh, prevent it. Um, there's just not enough oxygen in the can, uh, to treat AMS in a hospital. You get two liters of 99% oxygen, oxygen a minute, um, two liters a minute. And most of those cans have five liters. So that's about two and a half minutes worth, you know, of oxygen. So it's just not enough. Um, you know, I would do it the old fashioned way and acclimate. <laughs> All right, now step five is the uh, exciting part of actually going on your 14 or hiker climb. Um, there's a, a few tips here that I've collected, both from my own experience, uh, sort of best practices I've picked up, uh, as well as people people's advice that I've gotten uh, in person, on the trail, and even in some of these programs. So feel free, you know, as, as we go along here, if you have any tips on what you enjoy to do while hiking or on the 14ers you've been on, please feel free to share it uh, in the chat because it's helpful both to the group and also to me, uh, because we definitely all, all are still growing as climbers always. First couple of, of high level points here, uh, be sure you can reach it again. Uh, this is especially important in spring and fall when snowfall can actually close some of these trailheads uh, earlier than you might expect um, or keep them closed later than you'd expect. So definitely check to ensure the road is accessible and that it is open. You wanna start early to avoid those storms that come from the Colorado monsoon. Uh, this has the convenient side effect of also avoiding a lot of the crowds. Uh, one good surefire way to avoid the worst of them is to attempt a sunrise hike, you know, to really get out there pre-dawn with a headlamp and, and see if you can get up mostly by dawn. Um, other good safety tips are, first of all, to leave plans with someone back home and to be as detailed as you can, um, you know, at bare minimum, the person should know what trailhead you're going to, but you can be more helpful to them if you also let them know what gear you have with them, what it looks like, uh, if you had any more detailed um, itinerary notes on which route you were going to take. Um, this can all be very helpful to the sheriff in search and rescue if something were to happen to you. Uh, essentially make better decision-making plans you know, as they're doing their rescue attempt. A last note that I added here after the COVID years saw the the mountains kind of swamped by people um always make sure you have a plan b option because you may get to the trailhead and it's completely full um a lot of people try to park on the side of the road but that is really quickly causing problems um accidents that kind of thing um access problems for emergency vehicles um and it's one of the reasons why quandary peak now has uh, a permit requirement so Instead of being part of the problem and, and squeezing your car in, um, try to have a plan B, uh, someplace you know will be a little less busy so that you, you're being part of the solution and going someplace else uh, rather than you know filling up that lot even more. In terms of going on the actual hike, I recommend going on a, a pretty good pace and just trying to be able to hold a conversation barely. That's the, the pace I look for. Um, holding a conversation just kind of makes things go quicker, but it's also an easy way to note that you're not pushing yourself too hard and sapping all your energy reserves, you know, too early on in the hike. 
A general uh, rule of thumb is to also take fewer longer breaks rather than uh, more short breaks. Uh, if you think of yourself like a, a car, every time you turn yourself off, like turning a car off, um, you've got to restart it by by using some energy, um, you know, for the ignition. You can actually, you know, run out of battery in a car and you can no longer turn it back on. Same with yourself. Uh, so every time you take that break, you're expending extra energy trying to restart yourself. So it's better to only maybe stop once every hour and stop for a good 10 or 15 minutes so you can have a snack and get some water uh, and give yourself a break. Um, the worst thing to do is, is to take 10 steps and then stop for a minute uh, because you're just wasting so much energy getting restarted every time. At these breaks, it's a great idea to stay hydrated constantly, take little sips of water and eat some small snacks. I do recommend a camel pack simply because it's easier to remember to take those uh, take those breaks and drink if you have that tube right next to you. A lot of people find it problematic to stop and pick their back up and, and, and open it up repeatedly. So a camel pack helps with that a lot. Lastly, just make sure you're following trail etiquette uh, when you're out there. Um, you know, a lot of people, uh, myself included, uh, go to the 14ers to sort of get away from the stress of daily life. And, and so I like to say it's best if we all leave that stress behind us. So, you know, be nice and smile. Um, and one note uh, is to always yield to those who are going uphill. Uh, this is just because those who are going downhill have gravity going with them. And so it's easier for them to get restarted. Uh, they essentially don't really have to, to expend that ignition switch energy. Uh, they can just take a step forward and gravity will carry you downhill. So that's the reason why we yield for those going uphill. We had one question come in. Someone is planning a five night backing bit backpacking trip along the PCT. Oh, super fun. Um, they asked, does this improve their chances of uh, avoiding AMS? I almost certainly does. Um, I don't know those specific locations. Um, I have been to Mount Whitney, I've climbed Whitney. Um, and if you're climbing over mountain passes, uh, you're gonna be getting uh, enough elevation to get substantial acclimation time in. So um, definitely that's much better than people I've seen who you know fly into the airport, drive six hours, and then start up the mountain uh, without any type of acclimation whatsoever. Um, it helps, you know, anytime you can take multiple days, it's gonna be a big improvement over just showing up or, or even getting there the night before. So yeah, that'll definitely improve your chances. Alrighty. Most people these days have heard of Leave No Trace. Um, however, um, I like to repeat it because the mountains are getting so busy um you know we're seeing more and more permits and regulations every year um necessarily so because a lot of areas are getting trashed um and uh so i always go through this just because i think it's it's really important one for us to practice these things ourselves but also so that we can help other people who might not be as experienced and and simply just don't know better you know that is the most common way that people um Leave, an, leave a trace or leave an impact uh, is simply out of ignorance rather uh, because they, they want to. So um, these seven principles are really all encompassing and, and will go a long way in helping you reduce your impact in the backcountry. The first principle is to plan ahead. And all of you are doing that right now by you know watching this webinar. So you can give yourself a, a good pat on the back there. The second principle is to travel and camp on durable surfaces. Um, on a lot of hiking trails and camping sites, erosion is essentially the biggest concern because when you've got people using the same uh, you know, locations over time, uh, it causes gullies to form. And when rainfall comes in the mountains, it quickly can wash out a huge amount of soil and dirt. And so the key uh, here is to really stick to established trails, you know, stick to established campsites. Uh, I like to say that campsites are found, not made, uh, and trails are, are follow, not forged. So um you know stay on on the main route and you'll be going a long way with this one it also means of being extra careful on alpine tundra because it can take up to 100 years to regrow so definitely never drive your vehicle on tundra uh, and if you walk on tundra spread out as a group so that none of you are, are walking in the same spot twice and, and you don't form a trail disposing of waste is is really important both the waste we bring with us, like trash and things, we should always pack that out, but also human waste that we produce. Um, the general rule of thumb is, is to hike about 200 feet, uh, at least 100, preferably 200 feet away from any liver, rivers, lakes, creeks, streams, 
keeping in mind that a lot of these bodies of water um, eventually provide drinking water, you know, lo to local mountain towns and communities. So uh, make sure we protect the water and, and go far away where it doesn't flow. <laughs> Leaving what you find refers to both natural items, you know, things like wildflowers or antlers so that other people can enjoy them. And it also means leaving uh, historical artifacts, things that you might actually think are trash, but have been there for 50, 60, 70 years. Um, anything like that should be left in place so that land managers can make the decision on, on whether it should be brought out or, or whether it should remain in place for others. In Colorado and in California, really all across the West, uh, campfires are a huge are a huge concern realistically, given the wildfire threat that we face. So um, always take steps to minimize the impact of campfires if you choose to have one. Uh, the best policy is skipping it if you're able to, uh, because then there's no impact. But if you do choose to have a fire, two, two good tips to follow to minimize their impact is first to keep them very small, um, uh, very small, um, usually by, by no, uh, using no wood that is thicker than your wrist. That's just gonna keep the fire um, under under um, you know containment. And then secondly, when you get ready to put your fire out, um, we like to, in, uh, in scouting, we made uh, fire soup. We would essentially pour in so much water that you get a, a mix of ash and, and water like soup. Uh, and we would do that until we felt the water and it was cool to the touch. So uh, it's a little over the top, but these fires have been over the top. So um, you know we gotta fight fire with fire in that sense and, and go over the top ourselves. Uh, Susan asked, uh, can I give an example of what I mean about leaving old things out there? Um, sure. Um, I have uh, 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 so a lot of 14ers have mining uh, ruins near them or around them. And I've definitely, you know, accidentally been off route or been camping uh, and come across old, um, old paint cans, old soda cans from, you know, the 1950s, 40s, 30s. Um, as well as old mining artifacts. You know, there are old mill buildings that have old rope and old um, plywood for mines from the 1800s. Um, these are also old things that we wanna leave in place. Um, some people might consider them trash on the landscape, but they're definitely part of the, the historical legacy of the land. So um, we like to leave both natural items and man-made historical items in place, if that makes sense. The last two leave no trace points are really two sides of the same coin, the coin of respect. Um, the first is to respect wildlife, and the second is to be courteous to others. Um, you can do this by giving wildlife plenty of space um, and just by being kind to one another on the trail. You know, helping others uh, who need help if you come across it. I usually end up sharing water or ibuprofen at some point during a hike uh, and smiling and giving a good wave. All right, our, our last section here um, is knowing when to turn back. Summit fever is a very real. Um, you know, when you get up there high on the mountain and you see the summit just ahead of you and you also see a storm, it's really easy to think, I should just go for it and snag that peak. However, that can cause serious problems and it's one of the most common ways that a, a search and rescue story begins. So knowing when to turn back is a huge, you know, a huge benefit to help you and those with you stay safe. Uh, one or two notes before we dig in. Um, I just read an article, so I haven't had time to add this to my my um, notes here. But I just read a, a note about how, psychologically speaking, um, the best group size to go out with uh, while climbing in the mountains is three, uh, because it allows always there to be two people to sort of check one person if they're if they're not thinking straight or or they're thinking very risky. Um, but it also is small enough of a group that it doesn't really allow for group think to take over. You know, you don't all start making bad decisions because you're trying to impress each other yet. So three people, if you're looking for the the ideal size of a group is is what a lot of uh, I guess psychologists say is the ideal number. So with that said, we'll move into some specifics. Um, there are four big times uh, when you should turn around uh, when you're on a 14er. The first is if you see signs of deteriorating weather, which essentially means you're about to get hailed on, there's about to be thunder, it's gonna get wet. The things to uh, watch for here are building dark clouds or storms on the horizon. Uh, shifting wind can also be a good sign. Often you'll see uh, early on in the day, just you know, sort of puffy cumulus clouds. 
And as the day goes on and the mountains heat up and they start to warm up the sky above them, that's when you start to see those puffy clouds grow vertically. And that's sort of the first warning sign uh, to watch for. If I notice that that's happening uh, during a, a climb in the in the mid morning, late morning, uh, I will always take more more frequent breaks after that to to keep an eye out, uh, sort of be on heightened alert. If you see an actual storm on the horizon, actual rain, this is where I raise the, raise it to a red alert and and go ahead and turn back because if it's happening on the the ridge across from you, there's literally no reason it, it couldn't happen above you. In, in the next 10 minutes. Um, storms can develop extremely quickly uh, in the afternoon. So definitely watch for those, you know, and if that weather develops, go ahead and descend because the mountain will be there tomorrow. Exhaustion is the second thing to watch for. Um, essentially getting so tired that, you know, you're stopping for, for 15 to 20 minute breaks and you get started again and you need to stop again within five minutes. Um, if that's the position you are in, you're in a essentially in a state of, of exhaustion. Um, often you may, you're may you probably gonna be uh, out of breath and having maybe even a shortness of breath and you may have some level of heat stroke or um, um, other, other concerns, dehydration, depending on, on your situation. So if you're exhausted, don't push yourself, stop, turn around and call it a day. It's always the better the better option. Altitude sickness uh, is the third issue to watch for. If you just have mild uh, AMS, you know, you just have a headache and maybe some nausea, uh, you can usually take some ibuprofen or take some, some other over-the-counter medication and, and keep trying if you're close to the summit. However, if it progresses to the point where you begin to vomit or you notice people are confused or exhausted, that's the point when it's, it's progressing to the moderate or severe stage and it's, it's time to turn back. The good news is that Altitude sickness symptoms improve usually almost immediately once you start to, to descend. Um, oftentimes, people report that someone will have a very severe case, and after just 500 feet or so of descending, they they improve markedly. You know, they they stop being confused and they're able to to talk coherently again. Um, it's it's wild. So um, thankfully, you can you can get help pretty quickly. The fourth uh, issue to watch out for is probably the most obvious, uh, uh, really just injury or illness. Um, it is easy to trip and fall out on these peaks. Uh, it's it's pretty easy to twist your ankle or, or uh, you know, cut up your leg or something on a rock. So if, if one of these things happen, it's usually better not to tempt fate with future incidents, uh, especially since you're probably going to be more prone to one uh, since you're a little off your game. So definitely if there's an injury or if someone falls ill, it's time to turn back and call it a day. Now, in a worst case situation, if someone gets injured and their leg is broken and you don't think you can get them down even if you wanted to, um, that's when you need to start considering calling for help. Um, you can do this two ways. You can either call 911, um, you can actually text 911, or if you have a spot device or a satellite messenger, you can use that to get help. Um, and that is the more dependable method uh, because it's much easier to get a satellite signal out there than it is a cell phone signal in most areas. So that's why I recommend a spot device. Now, when you're you're able to, or when you've made the decision to call, uh, you might not have a phone signal or a satellite signal. Uh, so the best advice is to climb to a nearby ridge or a point uh, because the more light uh, sight of line you have around you, uh, the better signal you're going to have, generally speaking. Uh, before you call, take some time to plan out the five W's of the situation um, because you're probably going to be panicked. You're going to probably be worried. Uh, and it's easy to sort of bluster around on the phone for a few minutes. Uh, and that that call might get dropped. You know, even out on a ridge, if you only have one or two bars, you might only have 20 or 30 seconds to get all the, the key information to them. So practice the five W's practice spitting them out in 30 seconds, uh, and then make the phone call. Once you've spoken to search and rescue, uh, it's very important to stay put so that they know where to find you and, and you don't get more lost. And lastly, just remember, you should never hesitate about calling search and rescue uh, because it's free purposefully. You know They want people not to hesitate uh, and then get in even more lost or even more injured uh, which only per puts search and rescue crews in more risk. So call when you think you need it. Uh, if you're unsure whether you need it, the dispatcher can actually help talk to you and, and help you figure it out. Um, so they're there to help in every regard. 
lastly, uh, this is a section I just added. Um, I do recommend taking a little time when you get back home to debrief and think about the climb. Hiking and climbing 14ers is a skill. It's not a hobby. Um, and by that, I mean there's there's things you'll learn and pick up along the way uh, just by doing. And debriefing and reflecting on on your experience and what you've learned is the best way to help you know really direct that skill development over time. So I usually do this right at the trailhead. I'll pull out a, a little climbing journal I have, crack open a beer, and sit down and ask myself questions like, you know, based on what happened today, what should I start doing? You know, is there some extra preparation I can do or extra research that would have helped today that I didn't do? Um, I also think about what I should stop doing. You know, uh, was there something that I sleep in again? And did that once again mean I didn't make it to the summit? Um, that can be helpful for identifying any anything you can stop doing. And then lastly, call out the good things you do uh, that you should continue to do in the future. Um, taking a moment to do this and leave these notes and reflect on them in the future, it's really fun to watch uh, your progress go and, and look back and see what you've, what you've learned and, and how you've grown over time. So in conclusion, um, I will be sharing both uh, the video recording of this as well as a copy of the slides by email in the next day or two. So I recommend just reviewing them before you go on your climb. Uh, that'll make sure you know what you're doing and that you have everything you need. Um, but again, the, the key really points here is the, to plan ahead and pick the right peak, um, pack the right clothes and layers, um, acclimate if you can, uh, again, above 9,000 feet. Um, know those situations and what to watch for so you know when to turn back if you should. And then lastly, take that time to debrief um, afterwards to really help grow your skills. Um, before we jump here into the questions, I'll just uh, add one last note that the uh, you know the next summit is a, a really a labor of love of mine. It's not my full-time job. It's something I do entirely on the side uh, just because I know these resources are needed. So um, if you found today helpful, um, if you learn something new, um, I do ask that you consider uh, giving it back and, and giving paying it forward to um, the next group who will learn something. Uh, by making a gift, you can either give a, just a one-time uh, donation or you can become a monthly patron, uh, which means you give a gift once a month, but you also get access to uh, an exclusive newsletter that I only send to my patrons, uh, as well as some extra perks, things like 14 or planner templates and other things I've designed. So um, definitely check that out. Uh, at the next summit.org you can just click support the site in the top right corner uh, of the website uh, and that has links to all of those locations so uh, thank you again uh, we have some time here for some questions so um huh, one person asked do i lead climbs um i unfortunately i'm not i'm not a uh a guy in the sense that i don't have a permit with the national forest service um i'm actually looking into it um my hope is that next next winter i'll be able to do uh 14 or winter climbs uh and potentially next summer i'll be able to to actually lead climbs um i'm also hoping this fall to organize uh, some kind of a group climb just amongst the um you know friends of of the next summit to go uh totally free uh because legally i cannot charge for it uh but just the chance for all of us to go out climb a 14er uh you know meet people uh, and have some fun so um i don't lead climbs yet but I hope to in the future, if that um, answers your question. <laughs> yeah, any other um, questions? Uh, it can be about 14ers. It can also be about gear. It can be about camping the night before, getting to trailheads, resources, et cetera, compliments, complaints. <laughs> All right, somebody asked, uh, do I take bear cans if I sleep overnight? Um, only if you're camping below 10,000 feet. Um, that is sort of the the cap uh, elevation at which a bear will go. So if you're going on a route and you're never going to be below 10,000 or above below 10,000 feet, you don't really need it. Uh, but yeah, if I'm camping at a trailhead, I'll either um, keep all my stuff, all my food locked in the car to ensure that bear's not going to get into things. And if I'm on a trail, I'll bring a, a, a canister. Um, I definitely recommend a canister over a bear bag. I've just seen some horribly hung bear cans or, or bear bags out in the wild, you know, not high enough, uh, awkwardly hung. Um, one of them fell down 10 minutes after they put it up. Um, so the canister is just so much more dependable, um, you know, and honestly, if that bear 
gets gets in, gets food, and gets a connection, uh, the chances of it dying are pretty high. So definitely recommend the uh, uh, the bear canister. Uh, somebody said they live at 7,500 feet um, and they hiked Pikes Peak themselves. Uh, when they got above tree line, they were just exhausted based on my description. Um, yeah, that is tough. I will say that Pikes Peak is an exhausting peak. It's uh, one of the longest routes of all the 14ers. Um, and so that, that might be one reason why you you struggled so much, just that it's it's such a long hike. By the time you get to the higher elevations, um, a lot of your reserves are already sapped. Um, so um, definitely a shorter shorter fourteen route. Um, I believe that one is is over twenty miles in length round trip. Uh, and there are a lot of fourteeners that are more like five, ten, fifteen, you know, uh, miles. That's probably going to be a better bet um, if you're really struggling with the twenty mile one because. Um, that's that's a tough one. Uh, definitely one that I would I would build up to with some training hikes over time. Somebody asked what I suggest for a top base layer. Um, like I said, any of those micro puff style jackets are great uh, because if it gets too warm, you can take it off and, and pack it into the the tiny little ball and put it away in your bag, and it doesn't take up much space. Um, but really, any light jacket is probably a good idea. Um, the key is that you want it to be um, able to sort of block out wind if there is some. So you don't want anything that's too light, um, but something that provides insulation. But some kind of a jacket is is my my rule of thumb. Um, somebody asked about um, what about bear spray above ten thousand feet? Um, bear spray is pretty typically not necessary. Um, I was just wrote an article actually about bear spray and fourteeners, and I was doing research for it. I'm trying to find any record I could of a bear attack on a 14er. Um, and I looked pretty hard. I spent a good amount of time searching because I was hoping to find at least one. And there are none so far as I could find. So just given that, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of people now climbing these, that means it's literally a less than a one in a million risk. So given the weight involved of a, of a can of a full can of bear spray, I would just leave it at home. Um, I, I don't think it's it's required. Um, somebody pointed out um, great recommendation on taking fewer longer breaks. Um, definitely. Um, this can be tough for some people. So if you're really struggling with this, I recommend doing it, it. It feels silly doing it, but it's called the rest step. And it's literally what mountaineers do on thing on big peaks like Everest. Um, and it's exactly what it sounds like. Uh, you take one step and then you take a five, five, six, seven, eight and second pause, you know, and then you take another step. So you're moving so slowly, you're not really letting your heart rate pick up too fast. Uh, and if you're really struggling, you know, you're stopping every 30 seconds, every minute, it's better to take one step every six seconds continually and maintain that for an hour than to keep taking those breaks. So in a worst case, go with the rest step. It's, it's, I, I do it when I'm really exhausted. Um, somebody asks if I recommend COSAR cards. Yes, um, the, the COSAR card or Colorado Search and Rescue card uh, it is not insurance, um, but it does essentially, uh, it pays into a state fund uh, for search and rescue. And if you are rescued uh, by a search and rescue crew and you have the card, they're able to get reimbursed from that state fund for that rescue. So you can almost think of it as being insurance for the search and rescue crew that comes after you because it lets them get reimbursed for coming after you. Um, you won't be charged either way, but I think of it as just being sort of the the ethical thing to do to prepay for your rescue to at least a degree, um, you know, in case anything should happen. So um, definitely COSAR cards, great idea. They're only like $15, so. What are the five Ws? Ah, yeah, the five Ws, I never actually said them. Um, who, what, where, when, why? Um, so when thinking about someone who's in an accident, um, you know, who's out there, how many people, um, and what is their experience level? Are these like total beginners? Um, or these experienced outdoors men who can probably survive. Um, what is happening? What's gone wrong? Are you lost? Are you injured? Um, where are you? Um, and and be, be as specific as you can. Just saying the route and the peak is probably not good enough. You probably got to get them some kind of an elevation or or an idea of what landmarks are around you. Um, when when did this happen? And what is your timeline? You know, are people seriously injured that you need to be helped right now? Or are you just lost and you have all the gear you need to, to make it overnight? And so you just need a crew to help you find your way the next day. Um, and why? I guess I already said that, but why do you need help? What's the issue? So um, those are the key details. 
then search and rescue will follow up with all kinds of clarifying questions to, to you know, figure out what they need to do for you. So good question. Any other last questions about uh, 14ers? And if you do have anything that comes up, uh, you can always email me at alexdurr at the next summit. And I will actually just write that into the chat right now um, so that you have it handy. Um, and I always tell people, um, if you're willing and you do a 14er and you make it up to the top, please, uh, I would love to see a summit photo um, if you have one, uh, because it's it's fun to see people um, pushing themselves and getting out there and and knowing that, you know, all of this is actually getting used somewhere. So um, thank you um, all for coming. Um, if you have any other questions, you can shoot me a, a question there by email. Uh, and I will be sharing, like I said, the video recording here in a, in a day or two. Um, I'll just ask one last time. Uh, you know, if you're willing to to make a small gift to the blog to pay for web hosting and, and content, it really does make a huge difference um, in keeping this online and keeping it free uh, so that all the people who need to see it can. So thank you again. I hope you all have a great rest of your Tuesday night uh, and you have a great safe first 14 or hike if and when you do. Um, oh, well, someone asked one last question. I'll, I'll answer this one last one. Somebody asked, well, what uh, if you're caught in lightning at elevation, what should you do? My general rule of thumb is to get down as fast as you can. Um, some people will say you should, you know, get into the, the crouching position. Uh, but realistically, you are always at extreme risk as long as you're up there. So you should try to get down as fast as you can. Keep moving in the storm if you can. Uh, the only time you should stop is if the rain, the wind, the conditions are so bad that you cannot safely climb. You know, you're worried about falling, sliding up a rock, um, that kind of thing, or getting lost then you should stop and then you should try to you know find some rocks to get under um but typically you should keep moving if you can because you're gonna be in continued risk until you get back below tree line uh and realistically until you get all the way back to your car so um great question definitely it, it does happen once in a blue moon so all right with that thanks everybody have a great rest of your night and uh hopefully we'll see you back at one of our future webinars uh as we do these uh once a month so thanks again have a good night. Bye.